Well, it is right at five o'clock, so we're going to go, go ahead and get started because this meeting has a hard stop at six o'clock because uh, at six o'clock we start our middle school meeting, seven o'clock we have our high school meeting tonight. So um, we have a few slides just to run through in case anybody new is joining us. Um, and every meeting we always have a few people who haven't watched some of our previous meetings and don't have the, any background information. So go ahead to go to the first slide, please. Thanks, Sasha. This is just an overall slide that we start with for every meeting that we do. Our district task force is in the center and the task force has a, a doctor representative. Our head of nursing is on that task force. Also, we have uh, Karen Hirsch, who represents our board of education and all of our members of cabinet. And we get input from all of those white boxes that you see around the, the edges. Everything from transportation, professional learning, communications, athletics, um, all of those different areas. And, and this is quite um, a planning task in getting ready for September. Thanks, Sasha. These are just some of the meetings that are, are online and available. They've all been recorded. Um, you now, I would encourage you, if you're just um, starting to kind of play catch up now and to see what is in our information, if you go to the website, information throughout the summer has changed from the state uh, Connecticut State Department of Education. So I would encourage you to start with the newest items. If you do want to go out and see what is there, there's also a very robust uh, question and answer document. And again, tonight we have three town hall sessions, uh, six, uh, five o'clock, six o'clock and seven o'clock. We also have a special education town hall session on Wednesday. And then I will also just mention that the League of Women Voters are partnering with our PTAC, our PTA, and they are offering, a, they're hosting a town hall with me tomorrow night at five o'clock. And then we have a board of education meeting on Thursday. It's a very, very busy meeting week. So thank you to all of our panelists who are here tonight. Um, we've had a lot of focus group input where uh, families, parents, staff have come together and really helped guide the work of the district and how we want to look at as we prepare to reopen. And we're grateful for all of those inputs. We've also done a lot of uh, Q&A. Uh, with our community and our staff to be able to find out what those what some of those issues are and what are, what is something perhaps that we have overlooked and that's really what these town halls are about giving our community an opportunity to ask questions and allow us to provide answers our upcoming board of Info uh, board of education special meeting will be this thursday we do have the reopening on that agenda so uh, it, it is a virtual meeting and you are more than welcome to join in. And again, those are all recorded and you can see even more discussion. I'm sure we'll learn from these town halls that we do Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday this week. This is a question that has come up quite often and we had this decision-making process chart in our family note last Friday, but people will ask, how do we decide if we're going to be in person, if we are going to be hybrid learning or if we should be full remote. And this is a document that did not exist um, last spring at all. This is brand new going into September. And it was adapted from the Harvard Global Health Institute publication. And the state, the Connecticut State Department of Health put this together for us um, to provide school districts some, a really good guidance document. And it looks at low transmission, moderate and high based on the seven day rolling average of how many new cases per 100,000 population uh, per day. And so right now we are sitting at low, which favors more in-person learning. Thanks, Sasha. And this just gives you again, where you can look at the risk level and go ahead, go to the next slide. And this shows you exact, exactly in Fairfield um, what it's looking, by, uh, looking at by county. We also do watch, uh, which I've had parents ask, what's happening specifically in Greenwich. And Mary Keller, our head of nursing, sends me that um, every week. So we're not only watching the county, we're also watching local here in our community. And you can see right now that we're at 2.6 uh, per 100,000 population for all of Fairfield County, which is very low and, and puts us in that yellow range of the 1.4%. Thank you. So uh, what we are going to do now is go back to the main screen and we are encouraging our community to ask questions because we only have one hour 
And a lot of times on these town halls, if we don't need the full hour and nobody has questions, um, then that's okay. But we're gonna stay on for the full hour and allow again, um, just for any questions that are being submitted. So I'm gonna give it a minute and see if anybody that is watching tonight does have questions. Why have other districts in Fairfield gone to hybrid for elementary and middle school when the numbers are the same throughout? Um, that's a great question. And what I would say is that our approach in Greenwich um, has been a little bit different than some of the other districts. Everybody, when you talk to school superintendents, we're all dealing with many, many different factors. Uh, the size of our buildings, the class sizes that we intend to have before we do remote or anything else, uh, the square footage of individual classrooms. And as I reached out actually as, as recent as this weekend to some of my superintendent colleagues, many of them are dealing with situations where their average class size in their districts are between 24 and 26. So they were really struggling uh, in areas to get um, three to six feet. Their spacing in their classrooms was more like one and a half, one to two, which they did not feel was okay. And it is gonna be a challenge, they will tell you, um, to try to return to full in-person if social distancing is still required in those other districts because they're not able to get into that three to six uh, feet range. That's, that's a primary difference for us. We started by trying to keep our class sizes uh, at 20 or below, and we're working really hard around the district to do that. Then on top of that, we do have the cohorting model uh, within elementary, within middle, uh, for, and of course in high school, we're not cohorting, but that is why they're hybrid. Um, for our elementary level, we've been able to keep those numbers down. And now what we're watching is this next wave of how many students are actually remote learning because those students come out of the class list as far as students who are actually present in the building. Um, so that's why we've been able to meet the requirements in that yellow. And on the bottom of that chart, there's actually some secondary indicators. And the secondary indicators are things like, uh, do you have the square footage in order to manage uh, for your children? So when will we find out class size? Class size and class lists are gonna be right up into the last minute, unfortunately. Um, I know principals, it's, it's hard on them um, when, when that's the case as well. But we right now are getting all of our remote opt-outs and those don't close until Wednesday at midnight. And we've had a lot of families change their mind just once we reopened. Um, so by Thursday night, we'll be reporting a little bit more about what our average class sizes are and what it's looked like, uh, what it looks like for us. Um, is there any word on after school programs and how that will be offered? Um, at uh, ELC. And uh, Trish, if you don't mind, since you're on here as a panelist tonight, I know you and your team have worked hard about just some of the after school programming. Could you speak to that for us? Sure. Hi, good evening, everybody. I think you might be muted. I just unmuted. Can yep. you hear me, Mark? You can't hear me, Tony? We can hear you, Trish. Okay, thank you, Sasha. Um, Yes, we are planning for our after school childcare programs um, at the different schools. I know um, we've been working with um, Family First here at JC and at HAMAV and the bank program over at New Lebanon. Um, and we are planning on assigning some rooms to each of those after school programs so that kids may attend and parents that work will be able to have a, uh, an opportunity to send their kids to these after school programs. Yeah, and if I could just add on to that, Trish, thank you. I think that one of the things that we wanna make sure we're, we're clearly communicating to the public is that although we are allowing the childcare program- Trish, thank, uh, you, thank you. I don't know who's speaking, but I'm having trouble with my audio. Um, so they're texting me trying to see if we can, I'm gonna log out and log back in, uh, but I don't know if you answered that fully. Um, I'm gonna ask another question and let somebody take that one while I log out and log back in. Um, let me see. You all can hear me, right? Yes. I'm trying so to find I, one that's more of a principal question. Um, because when you ask about the percentage of teachers who are asking to do remote, we won't have those numbers until that is all closed this week either. Um, so that's something we're still working on. Uh, so I'm looking for a different type of question because you can hear me and I can't hear you. 
Um, Um, can somebody talk about uh, what we're planning as far as meeting their teacher? And I know uh, a kindergarten, are you doing anything for kindergarten orientation? So Mark, I might let you take that one while I log off. And then if you want to have panelists weigh in on, are we planning anything for kindergarten orientation? Okay, so before we go to that second question, let me just wrap up the first one. In terms of after school, yes, we're offering childcare programs. But what we are not offering at the elementary level, and this is important, uh, many schools have PTA run after school programs. Those will not be running at this time. The only authorized after school or before school programs are our child care programs. So now to move on to the second question, yes, we are planning for um, a kindergarten visitation. We are planning on doing it on September 8th. And I would ask uh, Terry, Trish, or Angela, if you want to share a little bit of detail about what you're planning at your particular site, uh, because it will look a little bit different than how we've done uh, meet and greet for kindergartners in the past. Go ahead, Terry. Hi. Hi, everyone. So at ISD, the three kindergarten teachers are planning a, a brief uh, visit for our kindergartners to join us on Tuesday, September, September 8th at 10 o'clock in the morning. And the goal is really for the students to visit their classroom, meet their teacher, and just orient themselves to their new environment, which will, they'll be visiting uh, the next day and staying the full day. So the visit on Tuesday is, is very brief. And uh, unfortunately, parents uh, will not be able to enter the building. And uh, we're still working out some of the details and that information will be dispensed to our parent community uh, very soon. Yeah, I think it's, it's important to note that the reason there is a difference in, in times between the 11 schools on when the kindergarten uh, visitations will occur is because we're also trying to be careful to balance the traffic um, that comes with sixth grade and ninth grade orientation on that day. So certain buildings may have a little bit different start and end times to their kindergarten uh, meet and greets. Angela, did you want to talk a little bit about what it'll look like at North Mayanis? You're on mute. It will be a lot like ISD, but we will be splitting our students into two groups. So a half for the first half hour and then the other half. Again, the idea is come in, see the room, meet the teacher, possibly a story, and pretty much that's it. Thank you. Andrew. No parents, unfortunately. Tony, are you back and plugged in? I can hear you now, but um, the questions do not show up for me. So I only see seven questions. So I'll ask a question and then perhaps um, Dr. Carabillo, you can do one and then uh, Mr. D'Amico, you do the next one. Um, and we'll call on one of the panelists. I'm not sure what's happening tonight. Um, one of the questions was, will children uh, be able to get waivers to wear masks at school? And by the legal answer to that question is yes. However, I will say the Connecticut uh, State Department of Health has come out very strongly in the last, really the last week, and has made the statement that if a parent feels as though their child for a health or medical reason uh, cannot wear a mask, that they really should not be at school and they should be choosing the remote option. And we do understand that we may have some children with special needs that we will need to try different types of masks, that we may have a uh, need to try different types of shields and you know, get creative with our little elementary um, kiddos, especially uh, having a fun hat with a shield on it. So that's where we stand as of today. We do believe we may get some more guidance on masks. Um, our Board of Education is also working on a mask policy right now. They will have a second reading of that policy on Thursday night. And in that policy, it also defines even just types of masks. So we're trying to be as safe and careful um, as possible with that. Dr. Carabello? Oh, you're muted. Uh, one of the questions is, If a person in class needs to quarantine, what would that look like for a student in kindergarten? 
If the class has to quarantine, then the student would have to go home for two weeks and all of the children would go home for two weeks along with the teacher. So that's what it would look like if a student has to be quarantined and the class has to be quarantined. Okay. Thank you. Mr. D'Amico? Uh, can we please implement daily temperature checks? So um, I'll give my best answer. Based on the research that we've, we've been given, there's actually very little evidence that daily temperature checks is a good way of identifying whether a student or, or, or an adult is actually infected with COVID. You wanna add anything to that, Dr. Jones? Yeah, you did a great job. And don't hesitate when you read the question to send it my way. Uh, I'm happy to answer any of them. I just can't see them. Okay. <laughs> um, for me, I'm only seeing that we put, we have 10 questions. And I don't know how many there are actually have been submitted, but I'm sure it's more than 10. Oh yes, it is. Okay. Um, the next question I'm going to give to Mark, it's can ALP be made a true cohort having students be in ALP for three hours in their general education classroom for three hours is mixing so many kids from multiple classes unnecessarily. So thank you for giving me that question. Yeah, well. and, uh, we've, we've gotten that question quite a bit and I think it's important to go back to what I've said earlier and I've said consistently. Um, the ALP cohort strategy was not meant to be confused with the, um, the strategies that we are using or, and, and or are implementing on a daily basis throughout the day to safeguard people's uh, safety and health. What I mean by that is we know the three key things that we're asking everybody to do is to wear a mask, wash their hands or Purell frequently, and maintain a safe social distance. Those are the three key things that will keep people as safe as they possibly can be. The ALP cohorting strategy was to reduce the base number of students in each class. Now a byproduct of that is of course, less students together in a room. Um, but it was never, been, never meant to be a lead mitigation strategy. Um, and if we're being honest, kids are coming on the bus and they are, they are going to be uh, mixed in by grade level and by the way they enter and exit the bus. Uh, kids will be going to childcare programs, so they'll be part of different cohorts. They'll be going to sporting activities after school. Um, so I think it's important to note that although the ALP cohort strategy is a strategy that we are using to lower the base number of students in a classroom, it's not one of the key three things that we're asking all adults and students to do um, to stay healthy. Uh, let's see. Will the music instrumental programs be offered virtually? I guess I'll take that one too. So, um, so here is where we stand right now. Uh, we have said in the past that uh, band and instrumental music at the elementary and middle school level will not take place in person. Um, but we do have a considerable number of students who are going to start the year in remote learning. So we are going to identify using our band and instrumental teachers to make sure that we are providing music instruction to our remote learners. And we are also going to look at avenues to be able to provide um, virtual lessons to students who are in school that perhaps they could source through their Google Classroom homeroom at home at their convenience. So we're still working through that, knowing that this is still a key issue that our staff members are asking us about and family members are asking us about as well. The next question is, where can we find school specific plans since all buildings look different? How can we prepare our kids for school opening with different norms? You will all be getting a letter from your principals and they will be explaining what will happen and they will be going over all of the new information with their teachers and then with their students. Uh, Trish or Terry or um, um, uh, Angela. Angela, thank you. <laughs> Do you want to say anything? as to when you think that you'll be ready to send your, your notices and letters out to parents? So we have been talking about that as a principal group and we are all getting our specific letters ready to go and we hope to um, choose a date so that we're all sending it in the same, on the same day or within the same week. So it should be forthcoming at about the time that the class lists go home. Great, thank you.
what is the plan for remote learners to stay in sync with in-school classes? So that's a great question, Michelle. Thank you for asking it. Um, really, the remote learning school is going to run at the pace of the students and the teacher to which they're assigned. Um, they are not running in concert with what's happening in school, but they are following the same curriculum. As, as much as I would say um, teachers within the same grade level try to maintain the same pacing, you teach to the level and to the need of the students in front of you. So on some days you could walk into several first grade classrooms and they could all be on the same lessons. But on different days, they could be off by a day or two just based on how quickly children ascertain the content or to whatever level they decided they needed to extend a particular learning experience. But in the remote school, teachers will be following the Greenwich curriculum and they will be moving forward in that curriculum based on the pacing of the students in front of them or assigned to them in their class. Okay, here's one for you, Dr. Um, Jones. If kids are quarantined for two weeks because of class exposure, will they do remote learning during that two weeks? And who teaches them during the two weeks? If you're talking about a full class that goes to quarantine, then they would actually um, be working with their teacher. So the teacher would also be quarantined if they were in that elementary classroom. So they would all go right to remote, full remote. Thank you. You're welcome. Another question, are Greenwich schools feeling pressure to align with other nearby schools, changing to hybrid models? Is the plan and hope to stick to this five day in learning format? You know, I would say as far as pressure, I think every district is different. So we, the superintendents come together every Friday from Fairfield County and we all meet. Um, we're all dealing with the same challenges. Uh, all of our schedules are different in many different ways. Um, the reason that some districts are going to hybrid, the reason we're not, again, we're all different. You know, I am very hopeful that we are going to have a full return uh, for K-8. And we've, you know, I feel like our administrators have done a phenomenal job. Our facilities team, just everybody has worked so hard all summer long to make sure that, you know, we are measuring between our desks, that we have those safety measures in place. We have taped the halls. Um, we started again with the intent of having smaller classes. And I know one of the questions I could see was talking about class sizes of 26 in elementary. We don't have class sizes of 26. Now in a normal year, could we have a 25 or 26? Yes, but we worked really hard this summer uh, to, not, to not allow that to happen. And I will say probably one of the biggest challenges for elementary principals is they've rebalanced their classes, I believe at least three times uh, for different components to actually get the balance just right. Um, and I'm very grateful to them for doing that work, but that's helping us keep class sizes smaller than you would normally see. So when we have our students in, some students are in out, some students are in special education, some students are in there with a the general education teacher, our sizes are very similar to some of the districts who are actually going hybrid because they do have 26, 27 students in a class. Thank you. My kids and I are very excited for in-person learning. How will lunch work? Will they eat in the classroom or in the cafeteria? <laughs> well, that is a great question because we are still working on that. We hope to have students have an opportunity to be in their cafeterias at least once a week. They may be eating outside and they may be eating in their classroom, depending on how much uh, classroom space they have to, for socially distancing, or they may have to go to another site to have their lunch. So we're still working on that. Yeah, and I might say that's one of those areas where every building is different. And I know the principals recognize that they all have different size cafeterias. They have different type of cafeteria furniture. So on uh, you know being six feet apart on a round table versus a long table um you know do we need to swap furniture out to make it work there are all types of problem solving solutions that have taken place but it is individual for each building and i don't know if one of the principals is there anything you want to share about lunch sherry i think ann covered it okay good 
So I'm gonna ask a question that I, I see a common thread. So it's, it's been asked differently, but it's pretty much the same thing. Um, and it starts with a nice, uh, would you make sure to give a big thank you to all of your team? So I sure will. Um, also, is there a possibility that the K-5 offsite or remote learners could meet their teachers socially distanced, of course, at the beginning of the year? So I do think, uh, Dr. Jones, I believe you sent me something this weekend uh, to, to this, and that that's a great idea. And, and I think it's really important to say this. Um, we want children to be able to establish a relationship and develop a rapport with their teacher, whether it's students returning physically to the buildings or students who um, have elected to start the year in, in the remote learning um, school. So we are going to look at whether or not there is a, a way for us to provide that opportunity for the remote learning teachers to connect with their classmates. Um, certainly, we, we haven't figured out um, what that will look like yet because we don't actually know the final numbers of who's going into remote learning and who's not. So once the uh, survey closes on Wednesday, we have a lot of work to do in a short period of time. But this is something that we are paying close attention to. And if there is a way for us to be able to do that, um, I think everybody would agree that we would like the, the children to be able to meet their uh, teacher in person. And I'm sure the teachers would like the opportunity to be able to meet their students uh, in person as well. Now, if we can't make that happen in every circumstance, um, that could be because of a particular situation. Um, I know everyone will be flexible and, and understanding. Um, but we will be spending a lot of time in that first week developing opportunities for kids to work with their teacher on norm building, uh, setting up their, their classroom expectations. And, and again, most of what happens in that first week of school is learning about each other. The teacher sharing their experiences from the summer, students sharing their experiences from the summer, albeit maybe not a lot of people travel to, um, to many vacation spots, but I'm sure there's still some summer experiences worth sharing that will allow that bonding experience to begin and to start to take hold as they develop their uh, learning communities um, across the year. So the next question, for families with children in multiple schools, what is the guidance or practice if one of the children in the family's cohorts needs to quarantine due to an exposure? Do the cohorts of the siblings at their schools also then need to quarantine? So I believe that Mary, Keller had answered that question. It would depend on the contact tracing and if that child did indeed have someone in their family who perhaps tested positive for COVID, then the siblings would have to quarantine. But if it was just the sibling in a classroom that may have had an exposure in that classroom, then probably not. But that would be up to the health providers. Other than moving outside the low classification, what other metrics might prompt a move to hybrid or remote learning? Um, say, say the first part of that question again, Mark, just because sure. I can get... Other than moving outside the low classification, what yeah. other metrics might prompt a move to hybrid or remote learning? So below the low, uh, middle, and high chart, uh, right underneath that are the secondary reasons. And those would be things like I've mentioned some of the other districts are faced with where they have very small classrooms and they can only socially distance a foot between desks. Uh, maybe they didn't have any desks in their district at all anymore and they just couldn't even simply afford to switch to desks where we were a little bit fortunate in that we started transitioning to 21st century furniture but we still had some desks in storage around the district. We were able to purchase some more um, but if you don't have adequate spacing that could actually send you to hybrid. Um, we know right now we are okay with that, but if we saw an influx in enrollment, um, you know, in October and November that we were not anticipating and it was driving our numbers up, that could push us. Um, we also could have a challenge where we're not able to get as many substitutes and we're getting into flu season and we have some staff who are falling ill and that could push us to a full remote. So. There are many, many factors that um, could turn us in any one direction, especially when we do get into flu season. And one of the questions I could see a minute ago actually was talking about how will you distinguish between the flu 
uh, in COVID symptoms because so many of them are very similar. And I know that our head of nursing is working really hard with all of our nursing staff um, to be able to really understand the difference, but it is also gonna be very difficult because they are so similar. Um, that's all. Ann? I think I'm gonna give you the next one, Mark. Can you walk through a normal day of school for an elementary student, no out, no services, et cetera, how does it change for students who previously would have left the classroom? So if I'm understanding the question correctly, this is for a general education student. Um, the day looks very similar to, it, to the way it would have last year. The, all of the core academics will be assigned a time during the school day. In the upper grades, we are front loading our language arts and our STEM blocks. Um, to provide for uh, that larger block of time for our ALP cohort to go out. There will be an identified lunch block of time in the middle of the day, usually between 11 and 2 or 10.45 and 1.30, depending on your school start and end time. There will be an identified 30, to, 30 minute to an hour long special every day. So all of the core content areas are still going to be um, instructed in with the same allotment of time um, the way that we, we, we worked around the, um, the ALP cohort block was simply just to move some of our core academics to the morning, whereas they may have been spread out um, more evenly throughout the day. So there's not much of a difference between the way um, a schedule would have looked uh, in years past. And Angela, Trish, and Terry, if you want to uh, add anything to that, you're, you're welcome to do so. The only difference, Mark, would be uh, some of the delivery models are different. So art and music will be in the classroom, so the children will not be going to the art room or the music room, but they, the teachers will go to their classroom to provide instruction. Uh, FLESS instruction will be delivered remotely uh, as opposed to the teacher coming into the classroom. So the content of what they will receive is consistent as in the past. It's just the delivery model might be a little different. So, done. Yeah, and just to emphasize what Terry uh, mentioned and the purpose for having the art and the music teachers going to the classroom, again, are strategies to minimize the amount of mixing throughout the course of the day. At the elementary level, uh, students will start, uh, several, three grades will start with an eight week cycle of art uh, coupled with PE throughout the week and uh, three grade levels will start with music for an eight-week cycle coupled with PE um, and in the primary grades they will also have a, uh, a media instruction as well. The idea again is to minimize the number of adults going back and forth between classrooms across all six grade levels. Um, there was a great question that I wanted to ask because I'm almost just as curious in the answer as the person asking it. Um, and we've answered thousands of questions and, and this one I, I have to say is, is the most interesting of them all. I understand that virtual class will be a combination of live and recorded videos. What if the student is quarantining in Hawaii where the time difference may make it prohibitive to dial into live classes? So we actually had this last spring. Uh, we had people who asked us if they were on their sailboat, you know, what was their flexibility if they still live in Greenwich, but they didn't want to stay in this area. We had people who went to their cabin in the woods, um, you know, to get away from the area. It's, but ultimately, the one thing that our community has said to us is they wanted to have a schedule uh, and that it was very important this year. So if you're in a time zone, um, that is not conducive, to, you know, to the hours that your teacher is going to be on. Um, you're probably going to have to set your alarm clock and just wake up at weird hours um, because the teachers are on a schedule and they, they don't, um, especially in elementary and K-5, it's a conference style, you know, discussion where the teacher's on the computer with the children. So you would be able to get some of the pre-recorded uh, and those lessons and you would work with your teacher but if it's a really difficult time zone uh, you may not want to do a portion of the live um, and you would just have to work directly with the teacher to do the very best that you can um, you know having family in Australia I've, I've been in those situations where you're trying to connect with people at odd hours of the morning so I understand 
Here's a question for you, uh, Dr. Jones. If we opted for remote learning and elementary and middle school go hybrid, will we have that option as well? It's much more difficult to go to a hybrid in elementary because of the way that we are structured with our teachers. Um, we are using live video instruction in middle and high school. We did not think that was the best model for a remote model in Greenwich for K-5 because we didn't feel like an eight-year-old um, just watching inside the classroom with the way the elementary classrooms operate was gonna be highly effective. So, um, you know, as it is right now, if your middle school and high school went hybrid, uh, the elementary would go hybrid, but in the style model. Did I answer that, Anne? Yes. Okay. So I think this next question uh, might actually be for Sasha. When will the Greenwich Public Schools website be updated with the 2020-21 items, such as bus schedules, welcome letters, et cetera? And by the way, thanks for making all this possible. Can I take that for Sasha? Sure. Because they're all in my inbox. So this is another one of those. So I don't want Sasha to get the blame. Um, the, this is another one of those items where as we get closer to school, we've had so many adjustments and changes. So um, number one, we're really looking at, we're going to be sending out very shortly to find out who's actually going to be riding the bus because we are asking parents um, to, to drive their children as much as possible. So those families that find busing absolutely essential for their families can have their children socially distanced on the bus. So we're working on that and bus schedules generally only come out about a week before, um, if we're lucky. They're, they're very difficult and change frequently. The other thing is we're making sure that when we, as we're meeting with the police uh, department on um, drop off times, pick up times, that we don't need some slight adjustments, uh, five or 10 minutes in either direction and how we drop children off. And there's just a lot of meetings that have to take place as those are all being solidified. So we would hope within the next, I would say within the next week or so, uh, they'll see most of that up on the web and ready to go. Um, Mr. D'Amico, I'm giving you the next question. What are the platforms for learning that we should expect? Great question. Uh, and one I'm happy to answer because we are minimizing uh, what I think in the past may have been a, a confusion uh, for some people. Um, this year, we are opening with Google Classroom as our, our platform or our, our, our landing point, certainly uh, K-8 and in many cases in the high school as well, but we still are using Schoology. Um, but we are using those two platforms as our home bases. Now, you may have heard uh, of Seesaw because it's very popular in pre-K through second grade. And Seesaw will be utilized. It will be a mainstay in our primary grades, but it's not going to be the home base. Google Classroom will be, the, um, will be the place where children will log into in the morning, and then they will go to their classroom activities, which may springboard them out to a digital platform like Seesaw. Um, but you will hear the term Google Classroom quite a bit this school year, and in some cases at the high, higher levels where there's a lot of content that's already been stored, uh, Schoology will still be in use. So the two platforms, Google Classroom and Schoology. Um, let's see. Will there be daily or regular testing of staff and students? Um, there is not regular testing of staff and students. We can't require that. Um, as a public school, we have been um, looking into the option, trying to figure out if there is actually a way that if people want to use, for instance, their health insurance and get tested, can we make that mechanism available? Testing is still not an easy thing to access uh, when you have not, when there's, when you're not showing symptoms, um, because it's still being reserved largely for those people who need it. Um, and, and the results are very different in how long they take to return. But that, I actually just sent that question um, today because we were looking at could we uh, possibly get a van that would be out front of GHS so those teachers and students who wanted a place to go get tested could do that. But we haven't been able to bring that to fruition as of today. Here's a question. Can we visit the classroom before sending kids to school? 
Dr. Jones. Can you visit, say that again, the classroom? Um, they visit the classroom before sending their children to school. We're not allowing anybody in the building and that's because the buildings are being disinfected. Uh, and again, you know, it kind of goes with another question I could see on here because now I can see about 99 questions. So there must be a lot in there. Mm -hmm. um, is that we do have teachers um, who are nervous about coming back and we want to do, and administrators, and we want to do everything possible to help them feel confident that the building is clean, that it's sanitized, and the fewer guests and people that are in our buildings um, makes people feel safer. And so I'm sure what will happen is teachers are going to give you those virtual uh, tours of their classrooms, which you've seen probably all around the country. Uh, teachers are so creative so that parents can get a glimpse of what it really looks like. The next question, does the district have plans for a virtual open house? What might parents expect and are there any dates available? I think as far as once we know our numbers, you know, r remote is a new animal for us. Um, and once we actually know how many classes are we talking about, um, you know, which we will know when everything closes on Wednesday and we get that all settled. I think a remote um, parent night, what did you call it? Um, open house. Virtual open house. Thank you. A virtual open house is a great idea and there's no reason why we couldn't do that because the open houses in our elementaries will actually be virtual. Um, there, as, a, as of today, they would have to be virtual because we are keeping those buildings really tightly closed uh, for safety. There's a question for um, the elementary principals. Are you going to do meet and greet for first graders? My child is new to the school and she is a little bit intimidated by not knowing the school. So for new students, what are you planning on doing to help them feel more comfortable? Trish? And I'll start, um, we're hoping on the same day that we have the kindergarten orientation at a later time during the day to have the teachers meet some of those new students outside um, the classroom to say hello, meet the teacher and learn a little about the school. Terry? Yes, we're planning something similar to what Trish described. And also uh, at some point we're hoping to do a video of classrooms uh, to send out uh, so that the students, and not only the new students, but all the students can see it. We also at ISD, uh, our mascot is uh, Sparky the Dragon, and we have uh, Sparky visiting us, and um, we're going to video him following the rules, how to put on a mask, how to wash hands, and all of that, and we hope to have that available uh, for our school community as well. Angela? Ditto. Um, we will also be having a meet and greet with new students and creating a walkthrough virtual tour of the building with teachers in their rooms showing each parent what the rooms look like. So I think we've all planned together to make for a very smooth transition. Yeah, I think it's important to note that although we have 11 elementary schools, Trish, Angela, and Terry had three of three, um, they're the three team leaders. So there are several principals that meet with each one of them. And the purpose of that is for alignment and consistency across all 11 schools. So when each of the individual teams meet to discuss things like how are we going to handle new student onboarding to our schools, the three team leaders get together and make a determination on what would work best for all of the schools. And then ultimately there's a consistent message that's broadcasted out. That being said, I think what else is important to note that everybody picks their neighborhood school for a particular reason. Every school has a certain essence to it and spirit to it. And that's what makes our 11 schools special and unique. And we wanna to continue to allow that to occur. But we do know that there needs to be, for all new students, a clear opportunity for them to have an experience in meeting their new teacher, because we don't want it to be a, a scary experience for anyone. So whereas it may look a little different in every school, every school will have something planned for them. 
Uh, let's go to the next question. How will flu season be handled when COVID and flu symptoms are so similar? And that really comes back to our nurses um, and, and the training that they have. And, you know, I, I saw a question earlier where a parent was saying that their child in the winter often does get a cough, you know, has an inhaler. And one of the things that uh, Mary Keller has uh, spoken to on many of these town halls is really understanding what are normal symptoms for a child and, and what is abnormal. And if a child normally has asthma as a parent, generally you're gonna recognize that in your child and it's gonna be working with the nurse. It is not gonna be easy. I think that when you talk about flu and COVID and uh, just this weekend, I was reading an article where they're questioning um, if in fact, some of the flu cases uh, just last year were actually COVID. So I, I think it will be a challenge for us. And when it becomes a challenge and we're seeing uh, a rise, that's when your health department will probably step in and ask that we go remote. Next question, what are the measures you are taking to make lunch and snack time safe for the children? Will they be at least six feet since the masks will come off? Will the children be allowed to talk during lunch? If the parents and students feel unsafe, can the parents take the student out during lunch hour? So for lunch, yes, we are, we'll make sure that they are six feet apart. For snacks, we are still working on that as to where students can go to have their snacks to ensure that we are keeping them six feet apart when they have their masks off. Um, where did I lose the last half part of that question? Um, I just lost uh, the parent uh, the parent picking up the child and bringing them home. Oh, thank you so much. Dr. Jones, I defer to you for that. Say that I could put in here. If a child, if a parent wants to pick a child up for lunch, can they, rather than having the child stay in school for lunch? Um, we would prefer that a parent not do that because number one, it would be very disruptive if parents started doing that. Um, and, and really, if they're concerned about them eating lunch, we would encourage them to go remote um, because they're going to have math breaks on the playground. They're going to have um, you know, snack breaks. They're going to have other times uh, during the day where that mask, you know, could be off. So we would discourage a parent from doing that. Uh, this question has come up several times, so I think we should probably answer this. My elementary child's ALP testing was interrupted back in March. What are plans to resume this? So I recently met with our ALP coordinator, Bonnie O'Regan. Uh, who has identified all of the students who have actually completed all of their assessments and she's in the process of scoring those results and communicating to parents the results. Um, but there is a large number of students who are in process. Uh, we expect a letter to go out from her office this Wednesday to families where this is the case and we will identify how and when we will complete that testing before the school year starts so that we can identify whether your child will or will not be um, gaining access to ALP services. Here's a question for you, Dr. Jones. I thought the cohort strategy is to limit quarantining to one specific cohort versus the entire classroom, including the teacher. Why does the entire classroom need to close if the classrooms are Cohorted. I actually can see that question and I'm trying to process what, the, what, what they're actually asking. Um, so if there is a situation in a classroom and that classroom mm -hmm. it is a cohort as a classroom, let's say there's a student in the classroom whose parent uh, was positive. That's where the head of nursing is going to come in, look at in fact, should that one classroom um, actually be quarantined to at least go home for symptoms. And again, that's going to come back to our nursing because there is literature where they will send students home for not the full 14 days, uh, but perhaps five days to see if any symptoms develop, if it was a secondary, uh, like a parent. But again, this is definitely not my specialty area, and that's where um, our nurses are going to be doing that for us.
Next question. While we are practicing mask wearing at home, my daughter sneezed with the mask on. She wants me to ask if students should sneeze with the mask on, will they be able to get a new one if they do, or how many extras should they bring? That's a great question. Um, and I think we've all probably sneezed with a mask on and it's okay if you do. The, the big thing is making sure that if children have cloth masks, that we're washing them at home. So you really have to make the strategy as a family on getting throwaway masks, which a lot of, a lot of um, children and adults find actually more comfortable, lighter and easier to wear, or if you're going to have a thicker, the thicker cloth mask. Um, but it is, it's washing it when they get home so that they don't turn around and put it on again the next day. But if you sneeze, it is okay. Uh, that's just something that's going to happen and you don't have to immediately go get a new mask. It's, inside your mask. That said, I would add, if it happens to be something like a bloody nose oh. or something that would require a new mask, yeah. I, do, I do want to make sure everybody knows we will have masks on hand and we will give a replacement mask, although it'll be a paper mask, but it'll get you through the day. Absolutely. <laughs> so speaking of school supplies, this is for our principals. School supplies included a face mask fanny pack. Is this any type of fanny pack or something in particular? So I think it's important to note that not every school is including a fanny pack in their back to school supplies. But let me answer why is there a fanny pack in the school supplies? Um, one of the challenges that we needed to face and overcome was what do we have elementary students do with their masks when it's time to go outside for recess uh, or if it's physical education class and they're um, allowed to take their mask off for a period of time. You can't simply put your mask on the ground and you, um, you, you, you want to make sure it's in a safe place. You also can't store it in a plastic bag. CDC guidelines are pretty particular about the type of storage you use. So each of the elementary schools um, has they're coming up with uh, interesting and unique ways to store the masks. One of them happens to be a fanny pack. I know in another school we're using an over-the-shoulder zip type backpack that PTAs are sponsoring. I know I'm working with the Greenwich Alliance to provide uh, materials like this for our, for our schools that may not have the ability to, to provide it. Um, but the idea here is to make sure that the masks are safeguarded when the children are allowed to take them off. If you've ever been to an elementary school playground, uh, when students leave the, uh, the building, their lunch boxes go in one direction, their sweatshirts go in a different direction, sometimes their shoes go in a different direction. And we can't have that with the masks. We need to make sure it's safe, it's orderly, and that every child is in charge of and has ownership of their particular mask, even in kindergarten. So having things like a fanny pack will allow the kids um, to safely take off their masks and then locate it quickly to put it back on to re-enter the building. Uh, Angela, Trish, or Terry, do you want to talk about any particular from your building that you're, you're thinking about? Trish? I think you covered it, Mark. We're, okay. we're going, we did not ask the parents to buy fanny packs, but we are working on that thought. Um, I know some schools are got a little drawstring bag um, from their PTA, and some schools have some type of clothing line situation uh, going on where the kids will have a personal spot to put their mask in a, in a paper bag. Thanks, Trish. Mm -hmm. So the next question is for you, Dr. Jones, although I could probably answer it. Can you, I do know the answer, but I'll let you answer it. Can you explain what the population that Greenwich Public Schools is monitoring to determine levels according to the governor's indicator of infection levels per 100,000 people? Greenwich has 62,396 people. Is it all of Fairfield County? 943,332. They do actually look at all of Fairfield County and then look at the per 100,000. But again, I will say we do drill down and actually look at what is happening specifically in Greenwich and especially um, because we are right on the New York border. And if you remember last March, it was kind of moving up I-95. Um, so we were the, what I think the first district to actually close uh, about two or so days before the governor closed us. 
Um, and that was because what was happening just across the border in New York. So we will continue to work with our local health department to make sure that um, we're not spiking differently than perhaps the, the higher areas of Fairfield County. But it is based on Fairfield County and all of Fairfield County. This is, a, this is an important question for us to get to before we close. Will there be a way to allow in-person students who stay home for mild sick symptoms to catch up on schoolwork while home or will they just accrue many absences this year? Will kids be penalized for being cautious and staying home for coughs, stomach aches, et cetera? So by the state right now, they, they're making adjustments and adapting, I mean, every week, uh, different regulations. At the end of last year, we were not taking attendance at all, which was very difficult in areas like high school, uh, not so much for elementary. Um, going into this school year, we are required to keep attendance. However, uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, if a child has had symptoms and they need to stay home and the nurse is in agreement with that, that's certainly not going to impede a child going to the next grade level uh, or have anything like that. We will work with the families if that child is at home uh, to make sure that they are getting work just like they would during the middle of flu season and, and other illnesses that happen throughout the year. And I might, sorry. Um, I might just ask this one question that um, I've seen a couple of times. Uh, in the past, school supplies have been pulled and distributed by the teacher to students when needed. Will students keep their own materials this year so children are not sharing pencils, other items, spreading germs? Uh, I was just in a discussion this morning uh, about the arts and how those supplies are being ordered. Would one of you like to speak to that, just on how you're handling supplies? Yeah. All of our students are bringing their own clearly marked even manipulatives, we've counted out, so we've divided them up for each class, but within that class, they're in small bags. Gotcha, thank you. So no plan to share at all. Good. You wanna do one more? Sure, we have about three minutes, so we can do one or two more. Um. Are there plans to do any sort of group or rapid testing for COVID in school to identify asymptomatic students? There is not, um, we're not allowed to make our students test. Uh, again, if there was testing available that families could access, that would be terrific. Um, but at this point in time, we don't have a governor's order that uh, number one provides for that, and number two would pay for it. Um, and number three, you know, to require a family to take a medical test. And then one last question. How will students with food allergies be protected if lunches are eaten in the classroom? Classrooms should be allergy free. Absolutely, the classrooms will be allergy free just as the cafeterias or wherever we have students eating their lunches. We will make sure that we pay attention to that and that students are safe. And with that last question, I'll just say we do uh, archive these questions. We'll go back through them, um, see if there are any questions that we can continue to address. Again, I am on a League of Women Voters um, meeting tomorrow after night, tomorrow evening at five o'clock that they're hosting along with PTAC. So some of these same questions will uh, probably be brought up uh, and we will continue to answer as many of these as we can as we go through these meetings. I wanna thank all of our panelists tonight. Thank you for joining us. And we are all going to log off and then a few of us are going to log on to our next meeting, which is the middle school. Have a great night. Thank you.